um, the forum is the first thing we we'll do is talk about the plans for the forum and the purpose. Why are we doing this? Um, and I won't go into in, in a few moments. But for this inaugural one, you know, it, um, we're going to give a brief overview and introduce the Forge program overall, uh, essentially what DOE's vision was in, in setting up the program and how it's organized. We'll talk a little bit about the, the Utah Forge team and the Utah Forge site. Uh, we'll give a brief introduction to the, the modeling simulation team uh, for the Utah Forge project. Um, briefly talk about the conceptual model of flow and transport for the Utah Forge site. Um, we'll discuss the native state model and we'll have Q&A. So the, the block of time we set aside for this is, um, uh, we, have, we have a two hour block. Um, I intend to speak for approximately 45 minutes. Um, we, we set two hours just to be safe. I don't want to keep everybody a captive audience or, or as captive as it can be from working from home for 45 minutes, but we'll, um, we'll take questions and, and go back and forth um, until we get everything answered. If we can't answer a question, we will actually get into the right person from the, the team to get the information to get these questions answered. So the plans and purpose for the forum, um, I guess just to start out by saying that FORGE is one of, or if not ever, the largest initiative from the geothermal technologies at the, universe, at the, at the Department of Energy's Geothermal Technology Office. Um, that being said, it's very important and there's a couple key desired outcomes for this initiative. And, and, and in order to achieve those, I think modeling and simulation will play an important role. We want to gain fundamental understanding of the key mechanisms of EGS creation, operations, and, um, and sustainability. Um, importantly, we want to allow the research community to develop, test, and improve these EGS technologies, enable rapid dissemination of the technical data, enable a pathway towards EGS development on a commercial scale, and of course, reduce uncertainty and risk. Um, Every, every step of that um, modeling simulation will play an important role in elucidating the behavior of the system from both essentially, you know, systematic scientific study as well as trying to do deterministic predictions of, of what we may expect at the site. So the forum is intended to engage the modeling and simulation community, but also just the, the community at large. It's going to provide a venue for exchange of information exchange of ideas, and also exchange of experience. Um, the Utah Forge is, is one team operating at a site. We, it, we would fully expect to have others uh, modeling this system or generating lots of data and making that data available. And this would be one way we could talk about it and get, uh, yeah, get the community's feedback. And lastly, the forum is intended to be a recurring event. Um, I wanted to get some feedback from you, the community, when we talk about how often we want to have this recurring. Um, we originally had discussions of whether it be a quarterly or a monthly event. Um, if you saw from my from my overview slide, we're only going to barely scratch the surface today of some of the modeling we've been doing. Um, so we'll spend a good bit of time just giving everyone an introduction. Um, there are quite a few people that registered that um, the names didn't look familiar. They may not be really current with what's going on at the site. So likely going to be a recurring event, and we will be pulling from the community as well as our internal team um, to give presentations at the forum. So FORGE, the Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy. Um, I, I would like to thank the GTO staff for providing a few slides here to give the overview, uh, you know, their overview of the program. And there's a couple key things that uh, come out uh, that's been you know, put forward for, for the goals and objective of FORGE. And, and first is we need to be diverse and transformational. We'll be doing research in subsurface engineering and geosciences. Um, there's a lot of work that can be done here. And this also forges in a very you know, integral part of um, leveraging things like the CoLab uh, Sigma V project at the Sanford uh, Underground Research Facility, as well as things like open solicitations that are out there now for the Wells of Opportunity. These things are all related and all kind of feeding to that goal of transformational changes. We want to have a world-class laboratory. That's simply an opportunity for the community to take advantage of, of an instrumented, well-characterized well -characterized and controlled environment. That's what we have at Utah Forge. That's what we're continuing to build. And uh, uh, many parts of the community will be part uh, of building this, this, this resource. And last, we're going to share, communicate, and educate. And that's really a big part of what this forum is intended to be, data and the findings to the broader technology and non-technical community. Um, you know, the my modeling team gives presentations, um, conference papers, uh, 
peer reviewed articles. Um, but there's still, it's, it's almost impossible to answer and address everything because, you know, we're pr pretty deep into it as in our day to day work. And so this opportunity to allow um, the community to pose questions and we can get interactively discuss um, will actually make it a whole lot easier to better communicate what we're doing. So following on from the previous slide is, you know, one of the, some of these goals to gain fundamental understanding of the key mechanisms controlling EGS success. Um, there's a lot of things we can look at. Um, we're going to talk the modeling part of it here, and it, but the modeling is, is a big part. Um, we can develop, test, and improve new technologies and techniques in an ideal EGS environment. And I'll talk more about the ideal part of that EGS environment as we go on and really start describing um, the Utah Forge site and, and, and provide some of that information. We're making integrated comparisons of tools and technologies in a controlled environment. And that's another thing that the modeling form will enable us to do, essentially to have, be able to, if we have multiple people or multiple teams doing modeling and simulation work at the, at the forge site or for the forge site, we could do quantitative comparisons of the results, um, either deterministic predictions, and we could do post-experiment uh, post um, validation verification of these models and understand and drive uh, our understanding of the, of the controlling processes and rapidly disseminate technical data and communicate to the research community, which we're doing right now. So the Forge structure, the tasks, and the funding. So I think many of you may have, you know, this will have seen this slide. Um, Gosh, if you could pop in, if you can see my mouse now or not. Um, but we're starting here, you know, the Forge program started, you know, uh, 2014, I believe it was, the original proposal um, came out for the phase one of site selections. Um, where sort of with, with five different sites vying to be what would be the ultimate, the uh, um, the ultimate site um, for the forge. We had a site in Fallon, Nevada, the Milford, Utah site, the Snake River Plain in Idaho, Newberry Volcano in Oregon, as well as the west flank of Coso in California. Um, for full disclosure, um, I, I led the Snake River Plain team uh, back in 2014 in the phase ones. And as, as the, the, the Snake River Plain site did not advance, um, I was pulled in and began uh, working with the Utah team. Um, I'm very thankful for that. Um, there was a downslip there, went from those five sites to two, to Fallon and to Milford, and through uh, a good bit of setup and characterization activities through phase two A and B, um, a downslip occurred and to, where the Milford, Utah site was chosen to be the final site for final um, selection and for a final evaluation for the forge for the Forge Laboratory. And as of recently, as of last October, we are starting into formally into phase three, it's implementation. So reservoir testing and stimulation, drilling, uh, continued site characterization and competitive R&D. So um, we are now in this very part here. The, um, it's very exciting. So this phase three is intended to be um, uh, five years of duration. And there's a couple key things that are gonna happen in, in phase three and I think First and foremost is the drilling of two, and I say, I'm air quoting, or more full-size wells. And from those wells, we'll be able to do reservoir stimulation, um, test connectivity and flow testing, and do dynamic reservoir modeling, and continuous and effective monitoring of the site. Um, through annual R&D um, solicitations uh, with envisioned anywhere from 10 to 20 awards for R&D technologies. Um, which along the broad categories of reservoir characterization, reservoir creation, and reservoir sustainability, the, the big three, right? So you have to understand what you have there, um, build it or create our heat exchanger, and then um, do the work to make sure our heat exchanger is gonna work um, for a long period of time. And importantly, um, that 50% of the, essentially the phase three funding for Forge is set aside for competitive R&D solicitations. Um, I believe um, I don't. I don't like to be held to a number, but the, you know, it's on the order of sixty plus million dollars will be available for external solicitations uh, over the course of phase three. The Forge team itself. Um, I wanted to just give a, an overview to, or and, and a thank you and an acknowledgement to all my colleagues um, on the Utah Forge team. So. Of course, I also have to you know, first thank the Geothermal Technologies Office for their innovative and insightful leadership in, in coming up with this whole program and the years and years of, of dedication to, to, to bring it to fruition. Um, 
the Utah Forge team itself is led by Joe Moore at the Energy and Geoscience Institute at the University of Utah. He's our managing PI. A um, couple of key players here, um, Gosha, who I already mentioned, is our project coordinator. Uh, Shirley Streff, Melly McKellar, um, essentially makes sure we keep all our, our ducks in a row. Um, there's five technical area leads, of which I am one, um, me being Pitgorny for dynamic reservoir modeling. Um, I want to mention John McLennan, who's also at EGI, uh, kind of leads the reservoir testing and reservoir engineering. Phil Wanamaker, who leads our geophysics team. Uh, Chris Pankow, uh, the University of Utah, who heads up our seismic monitoring. And Stuart Simmons, uh, who's our geology geochemist um, at, at the team. Now, um, of course, also, also important to mention are our site owners. I'm going to try to move my mouse slower um, so you can see this. Um, the, the Forge site in Utah, Milford, Utah, is situated or is, is set on Sitla, which is the school institutional trust lands for, for the state of Utah, as well as Smithfield, our, one of our um, industry partners. Um, very thankful for them to make that available. Um, and also, I want to point out here that we have another of, of other people that support the program. I, I won't be able to mention them all. There's so many, and I think this next slide should show why it's kind of hard to, to try to mention them all. So shown here essentially is the makeup of the Utah Forge team. At one time or another, the people you see on this map have contributed or continue to contribute to the overall technical objectives of Forge and establishing the laboratory. Um, quite a few people here to mention. I will talk about the individual individuals specifically of the modeling team, um, but it's just important to note that we have great partners, great collaborators here making the site, uh, building the site. And the Forge site itself uh, in, in Utah, it's located in, in south central Utah um, near the town of Milford. So if you go about three hours south of Salt Lake City on Interstate 15, um, you come to the town near Cove Fort or Beaver and you can go directly west um, to, to, to arrive at the, at the Forge site itself. Uh, and this site actually is located on the edge here. It's in the basin range, on the edge between the basin range to the west and the Colorado Plateau to the east. I'm gonna, this is a, a hopeful. So we have some drone footage here. So just a picture of what you're seeing at the site. This was taken last fall. Um, so what you're seeing looking here is a picture, an air photo of the site looking to the west, like from the east, looking to the west. Um, what you're seeing here is, is our well pad, that our main well pad for our initial characterization work in, in a conf, um, confirmatory drilling of well 5832. Uh, we also have some seismic and characterization holes here. There's additional wells and well pads being drilled uh, that will support the phase three operations. Um, let me see if this air photo will work. I hope that this doesn't just turn into a, a, a choke point for the fervor winds bandwidth. But uh, as we're circling here, we're kind of moving to the west on the southern side. So we're beginning to look to the north. We're still looking to the northwest, but we'll be looking more to the north. You can see in the background that there's sizable wind farms uh, in the area that we just changed. Now we're looking to the east um, once again, and, but the, the site is, is actually pretty wide open. And I'll talk more about these individual specific pieces and parts uh, of, of the site itself as we move along. So as I said, um, or, or as I was starting to say, um, the site, in, in talking about the site itself, uh, and my dog started barking, I apologize. Um, the site is very data rich. There are more than 100 gradient and deep wells in the vicinity of the Utah Forge site. So I'm gonna slowly move my mouse here. So on this map on the right-hand side, you see the forge area outlined in red that well 5832, which is the pad I, I already mentioned. Um, there's you know, all the, the green dots are deep wells that are nice say deep greater than 500 meters and the black dots are shallow wells that are less than 500 meters deep um, this red dot is the blendell geothermal power plant the um so there's been detailed geologic maps rock samples gravity lidar insar water analysis um, available. And essentially this site has been studied uh, as early as in the 1970s. One of the key wells or the key um, draw what drew the Utah Forge team to this site was one it was the plethora of characterization data. So there was an old, this Accord 1 well which I'm circling here, was drilled I believe um, 
in, in the late 70s through some of the early geothermal exploration activities. Um, this turned out to be essentially, uh, it wasn't suitable for a geothermal reservoir. There was no, the uh, it didn't detect the hydrothermal system, but there was a known hydrothermal system here at the base of the mineral mountains. And so having a conductive well here and the hydrothermal system here is what drew the Utah Forge team to begin looking in this area. Um, thermal data is from many wells. The areas has had seismic monitoring since 1981. Um, a couple other key features I wanted to point out here. The first is what's drawn on here is the Opal Mound Fault. So um, that would be this line that comes in through here, Opal Mound Structure, Opal Mound Fault. We couldn't really have detectable movement on the fault, but it shows up and it's, it's a very prominent feature in the area. And also the Negro Mag Fault or the Negro Mag Structure. I'll talk more about those as we go on, but I want, I want to point them out in relation to where the site is and where all the well data are um, as we start discussing these things. So a little bit uh, a geologic map here um, on the top and a cross section on the bottom and a few pictures of outcrops that are coming from the Mineral Mountains. The reservoir will be hosted in tertiary granitic rocks. They're exposed in the Mineral Mountains to the east. So these photographs you're seeing, there are multiple exposures of these, of the same reservoir rocks um, that we experience in the, at, at depth under the forge site. Um, the rocks are highly fractured and are, they're showing actually most of the green areas in the cross section. So um, directly green here and, and a lot of this green. Now we lumped a lot of the crystalline rocks and didn't differentiate between different types of granite. We just loosely called them granitoids um, to, to ease some of our work here. Um, the, uh, the region has temperatures at excess of 250 C been measured at shallow depths between or below beneath the Roosevelt Hot Springs and the granite surface between the forge site is an eroded and rotated fault surface. And that surface here dips at about 20 degrees off to the west. Um, once again, shown here, Opal Mound, Fault, Negro Mag. You see it's dashed, it's inferred through a lot of this area. There's thermal ground shown here. This will become important uh, later. Once again, there's 5832. Uh, these other numbers are the seismic pads that I showed you in that rotating air photo as we went. Um, also important to show here, and I'll show this again, but uh, um, once again, 5832 in cross section. Uh, cross section is coming uh, on an Apple mouse here. It's not liking this. Um, essentially, our EGS reservoir is, is generally in this area, well below uh, some of the alluvial sediments and fan deposits in, in, in the valley, in the Milford Valley. Um, the Opal Mound fault structure comes across here. On the right-hand side is where the Roosevelt hydrothermal system is. So this is where the Blendale power plant is pulling from this hydrothermal system off to the west. Uh, it's conduction dominated. Uh, so I've mentioned well 5832 a few times. And this is essentially the well that verified um, or was our confirmation well for the conditions we expected in the reservoir. Um, the well was completed and tested to a depth of 2293 meters. And, and I'll apologize now between working with the reservoir engineers and the geologists and, and the modelers, we bounce between units between feet, PSI, um, MPA, and and meters. So it's, I, I'll apologize in advance, but you'll see these things kind of go back and forth. Um, the bottom of 5832 reach a temperature of just under 200 degrees C. Um, have a, there's a full suite of geophysical and image logs available. And what you're seeing here on this image to the right uh, essentially is the stratigraphy where we had a basin fill sediments to about 3,000 feet. There's me changing units T on you again. And granitoid and reservoir rocks below. Here's the casing schedule. So the well is cased all down so for about 150 feet or so of a barefoot section at, at the very bottom of the well. Uh, we do have drilling and mud logs for the entire, um, the entire well, as well as temperature gradient logs. Um, you have FMI and geophysical logs for the majority of the well. Some of the upper basin fill wasn't logged. It had to be cased off for, for security of the tools. Um, have drill core from two different locations near the bottom of the well. Um, total about six meters total uh, of core in the, over those two intervals. Um, and we did stimulation testing in 2017 in the bottom of the barefoot section. And actually in 2019, we did stimulation in, in two perforated zones as well as the, the bottom hole section. And we, we ran some FMI logs. Um, Overall, a number of micro, I call micro hydraulic and, and defit tests have been conducted in, in the well to get try to get as 
best possible estimates of, of, of the in-situ conditions as possible. I'm transitioning into the, the modeling team and the tools we're using now. And I know I'm probably gonna miss um, some things here. Um, and if, if, if you worked with the modeling team over the, the years that we've already been working on this forge, I, uh, please accept my apologies. Um, but I wanna say that we've used a, a suite of numerical tools for modeling and simulation to date. And our, our goal initially is to develop a reference set of numerical models. And those reference models are what we'll use to share with the community. Um, the, the purpose of them is so we can all start with with some uniform, or at least a current understanding of conditions at the site, um, what the measured pressure, temperature, stresses are, um, how those get pushed into some domain and around the well. Now, I say we'll do this so we can share these things and, and work as a team to have a common starting point, um, yeah, not only internally, but externally with the community as well. I am going to talk a little bit about the code types we're using and the team members there because they've been working very hard on this and I think the, uh, some of the names are recognized. So the first, yeah, it's a miscellaneous thing and, and there's enough different codes here and it essentially rolls into, we've been, we have a lot of people that pop in and out and have worked on the project. Some have already done a PhD dissertation and left. Some are working on PhD dissertations now. Some are, um, people on my staff, some are people at other, other locations that have helped us. We're using some of our own research codes, um, codes like Arazu. We're also using, you know, that we're, we have sponsors and, and, and partners that are providing some software to us. Kinetics is another one. Um, and so, and, and important with this is that, uh, um, say, um, some of the people here that have already gone through, done a dissertation and left, like uh, Shivash, the first name I, I mentioned here for the team member, um, um, you'll notice it's these papers that they worked on are already hitting literature. You know, they actually finished some of these things on an earlier reference um, model or before a reference numerical models were established. So you may see some things coming into literature now that for work that was completed as much as two or three years ago, um, it's taken this long to go through the publication cycle. So some of those papers may seem like they're not using a reference numerical model, and that's because the the time frame for to go from completing work to having papers published in the open literature. Um, other names I want to mention here, though, in this Brian Forbes, Michael Janis, um, those folks have worked worked through the project and have moved on to, to greener pastures and, and graduated. Um, uh, other people that are actively working on the project, Pranay Asai, Peng Zhu Jing, uh, Joanne Li, um, either postdocs or staff at University of Utah or at the INL, Alex um, Goncharov, who is also a graduate student at the University of Utah, David Anders is a colleague of mine at the INL. So those codes and what those people are doing could be, have a very a big variety of, of, of uses, purposes, and outcomes, and not enough where I'm going to go through the detailed characterization and, and listing out of what they're doing. But um, moving on now, so we essentially try to put the, the modeling team into look at discrete mechanics, fracture mechanics, um, discrete fracture identification, manipulation, and understanding, and then um, have compa uh, companion or, or uh, as uh, continuum-based simulations that go along with them. So um, some of our earliest um, discrete methods, be it boundary element methods, uh, discontinuity methods, uh, was led by Ahmad Ghasmi at uh, OU using the GeoFrag 2D, 3D, um, and his students. Some of them I already mentioned up above. Um, uh, Ahmad's work pretty much went through all of phase two and helped uh, design some of our early stimulation and understanding what potential for stimulation might be. As we move into phase three, um, we've transitioned to using discrete element models, be it UDEC, 3DEC, Excite, and uh, Bronco Demjanic uh, from Atasca has joined the team as Ahmad has, has left. So we essentially have that working there now. Um, for just general DFN, discrete fracture network, um, creation, manipulation, understanding, um, we're using the FRACMAN suite of codes with Alita Fanilla at Golder, plus EGI and IL staff support her as, as necessary. That falls into that list of people. And for continual methods, we're using a finite element um, suite of models based off the Falcon code, it's INL code. Um, essentially does THMC modeling, um, specifically designed for geothermal systems. Um, we also are just developing a new code called Kestrel, which essentially couples well hydraulics with reservoir hydraulics. Uh, that's a work in progress now. It's a phase three task. Um, I want to point out that we have each code here. They, they essentially were picked or chosen to fill a specific niche and need, and there's overlap. So we've worked pretty hard to have handoffs between all these different codes 
where one code's results or input could be handed into another via pretty direct methods um, that working in, in collaboration with our Earth modeling um, suite of codes, uh, Leapfrog, Geothermal, um, from Sequent. So we use those tools to be able to initial to enable handoffs between these things. And so we can actually have, for any particular problem we're looking at, we can have more than one code um, doing a prediction or doing a, an estimation of what we might expect to see, um, essentially to be, essentially to try to bound as much as we can um, any code-based uncertainties or modeler-based uncertainties. Um, and, but the last thing I do want to point out that this is it's not meant to be a code comparison is uh, you know we, we didn't just pick codes to, to test them out or and, and all of it, the work we expect to do at forge is not a code comparison exercise that code comparison exercises have been done and um, the tools we're using here have been part of those exercises of one form or another over 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 time so I want to talk now and transition into the conceptual model of flow and transport before I talk about um, uh, the actual numerical modeling. So shown here on the upper right is essentially was the domain we chose for a three-dimensional geologic model. Um, and once again, uh, uh, that this was done with LeapFrog Geothermal um, and their suite of codes for handling um, subsurface data. Uh, I mentioned earlier that and the importance of that opal mound structure, how it has influence on the system. Um, it's just shown here in this bottom is the temperature um, based off the temperature characterization in phase 2b overlaid and colored. It's the granite surface colored by the, the temperature. And so what you're seeing here is that opal mound structure comes across right here is, is it's mapped on the geologic map on the top of the granite surface. Once again, it comes through here. So what you're clearly seeing in this area here is the Roosevelt Hot Springs, that convection dominated system and conduction dominated system off to the west. Um, in general, um, and I'll show more slides have detail about this, but groundwater flow direction is to the is to the west in general, uh, maybe a little bit to the northwest. Um, the heat flow is uh, a little bit more uh, challenging, but we'll t and I'll show more about that in, in the coming slides. So let's talk about pressure. So I'm trying to get the idea for the conceptual model to take a good handle on pressure and temperature distributions. So shown here, are essentially this the plot in the center of the screen are two plots or, or two lines, two best fit lines, the blue dash line and a red dash line. So the blue dash line shows a hydrostatic pressure regime beneath the alluvial fan in the forge site. So if you could see my mouse and my pointer, most all the wells in that make up that plot are coming from this area to the west of the Opal Mound Fault. Um, the upper plot, the red dashed line, this were the initial Roosevelt Hot Spring pressure uh, reservoir pressures uh, that show quite a bit of overpressurization uh, to the tune of approximately for the same elevation. So here's a thousand meters of elevation, a thousand, uh, yeah, a thousand meters, um, where we have as much as 500 or more psi overpressure compared to the west side of the Opal Mound Fault to the east side. What's important here with what that pulls out is that some of the structure of the Opal Mound itself or just the general geology of the rocks is that um, uh, the pressure of the fluid coming from the recharge areas, which are believed to be uh, off to the east, um, essentially had this, this bound hit here and essentially build up pressure. It, it also shows where the fluid, I'll show later, where the, the, some of the fluid that was over here built up and leaked over and came in around the north edge of the Opal Mount Fault, which creates some of our temperature regime at the site itself. And so the temperature regime was a good transition here. Um, so same, essentially the same thought process or the same wells, uh, the same physics uh, um, between our differences between the east and west sides of the Yopal Mount Fault. Um, wells plotted here, this is temperature um, versus depth. Uh, also shown here in, in the shaded area was, was some of the original forge criteria that DOE put together where you had to be between 175 and 225 degrees C uh, with a depth between 1500 and 4000 meters. Uh, what you have here is with the original base well that we based the Utah site on, the Accord 1 well, actually a fairly linear um, thermal profile from depth, um, uh, uh, which evidence of conduction uh, heat flow. 5832 was the well that the Utah Forge team drilled and I have logged multiple times. You can see also a linear plot here once we get into the, into the, into the reservoir areas, um, gradient of 
of approximately a little bit over 70 degrees C per kilometer. But when you move to wells that are on the east side of the Opal Mount Fault, so some of the wells over here in the Blendell area, the Roosevelt Hot Springs wells, you could see that uh, very strong um, convection dominated heat profiles in a, in a number of these wells that are off to the east hand side or the east side. Um, it's important for our conceptual model of, of the, the reservoir at the Utah Forge site is uh, conduction convection, essentially, if, if you could see my pointer. So now I'm gonna to try to bring some of this together for the conceptual model flow and transport because it'll become important as we start setting up our boundary conditions uh, for the numerical models. So shown in the upper right here is, is a figure from, uh, from Alice et al, 2018. I believe it was a GRC paper. Um, um, but so the shown here contoured is our temperature contours at approximately 200 meters in depth and in, in, in degrees C. Um, so don't confuse the, the open mound structure is in here as well, but there's also a number of roads that kind of parallel come through. Gets a little bit busy, but what's important, which you can see is at the end of the open mound fault to the north end, is that this high temperature outflow water that's not that was coming out of the Blendale power plant essentially is leaking past there and moving off with the groundwater flow direction off to the west. So this water is coming out, moving over here and putting a good bit of hot water in the near surface alluvial sediments um, at the site, uh, which does have a definite impact in, in, in the site itself. Um, the uh, in cross section, I'm just going to pull the same cross section up. Is so we understand that the groundwater flow direction is moving off to the west, essentially following the slope, give or take, um, of, of the area. Um, but we also have some strong thermal effects in the density of that fluid. Um, and in the, the granitoid itself, we have a hydrothermal system here on the, on the east side of the upper mound structure and a conduction dominated system to the west. Um, so as we put together our numerical models for the for the forge effort for the Utah Forge, we did not actually include the hydrothermal system as part of our reservoir models. We, other than for some early um, regional modeling, um, but all of our detailed planning models are focused on the conduction dominated area of the granitoid reservoir and some of the overlying sediments as necessary. Now, all the data that, that I'm showing you, all these pictures, everything else, and the, and the data that supports creating them, they're every, every, everything so far is available on openei.org or the, the geothermal data repository. Um, and we, to make it easy for the community to get those, those data, uh, we recently updated the Utah Forge website um, in, in two paces. So one link, I'm actually going to go to these live, so I hope this doesn't crater things, but we're going to try it here. Um, so the earth model is on the, uh, uh, I'm just going to switch links here. So the earth model, so a lot of data I showed you is available on this in, uh, you're not seeing my screen. I'm sorry, I lost my screen. I'm gonna take one pause. I see my screen share indicator stopped. I am gonna restart my screen share and come back. And I'm gonna trust that you can see my screen. I, um, I'm seeing a flash, bear with me for one moment here. Okay, so you're seeing my screen. So there's a number of different um, places where you could link to these. I'm not gonna trust leaving my, uh, uh, no, I'll try it. So we have the, uh, the, the earth model is here, we can go through it. But also on the numerical modeling page, there is a description of the data that we use and every, every data set has a link that could take you directly to the data that was used to create it. So initial conditions, the model dimensions, mesh files, everything is here if, if anyone wants to get those data and, and uh, dive into them or recreate the models that we've used. They're all available. So 
And I didn't want to leave talking about the site in general without saying a little bit about um, some of the initial plans for phase three. So this is the same, a very similar air photo that, that we showed before. This one is looking off, once again, a little bit to the northwest. So what you're seeing here is fairly well labeled is well 32 pad that we've showed a lot of the well data for, the seismic, the two seismic pads we talked about. Uh, electrical power has been brought into the site. I believe that work is complete. So power lines have been brought in um, to power our offices and additional work. Um, new well pads are being created here um, for what will be the first full-sized forge well. Uh, that well name is called 16A 7832 in Kettleman coordinates. Um, also putting in a new road and a well pad for a, another deep seismic monitoring well. Um, Lots happening here, lots of work is going on actively right now, um, um, and some work is still being planned. So I'm going to transition one more time here to talking about uh, modeling in general. So introduction of the modeling, and then we'll uh, dive into some of the details of the model. And I know I'm talking a little slower than I intended to be, but um, the modeling and simulation activities, they've been undertaken by the FORGE team, as I already said, number of numerical methods and codes. Um, We've been doing very detailed work to try to have a verifiable and a reference and version control. So essentially we have the pedigree of any prediction that we make. Um, and I would say the purpose of the modeling is to better understand the stress conditions at the site and largely right now to evaluate potential well configurations for phase three. Um, and as I said earlier, the model simulation, some multiple codes and numerical methods. Today's focus is primarily on the native state modeling and it will be with continuum base codes, so the, the, the Falcon code. Um, oh, all right, that's a good transition. So we're focused on a 3D thermal hydromechanics model for right now. Um, three main efforts for this. Is one was to incorporate detailed three-dimensional parameter distributions and the complex boundary conditions that I already showed you. Um, with the stress, you know, a lot of it comes down to, you know, understanding the stress as best we possibly can. So we did a lot of work to understand that stress and there's more work going on for that. And uh, I already mentioned well trajectories. Um, we had done some models in phase 2B that were really simple and relied on well 5832 data. So essentially taking a, a 1D model or a very small 3D model around the well, expanding it out. Um, would have it had very minimal boundary conditions. So what I'm showing here now, if you've seen previous presentations, um, the, what we'll show today is the most detailed parameter distributions and boundary conditions that we've used for the site. So initially, um, we're shown here up in the upper right-hand side and in, in the red is once again, the outline in the, of the forge and projected in, as a volume into space. And in gray is the phase two numerical model domain. It was two and a half by two and a half kilometers and uh, 2.75 kilometers thick, centered on what at the time we thought would be some of the planning uh, where the stimulation zone would, would be. Um, now the mesh is aligned with the principal distress direction of north 25 degrees east, and that was based on FMI logs and, and by the regional mapping. As I hinted, alluded to earlier, the geology in the model was based on essentially binary, whether it's the granitoid or basin fill sediments. Um, and we are also seeing here, some of these are structured and unstructured meshes. So we actually developed some workflows and we can hand those data points off for either, you know, Cartesian meshes or structured or unstructured. So some of the boundary conditions that we have on here, I'm shown here in this actual, in this image, it's colored by, this is the structured mesh colored by, I believe this one is colored by porosity. So we used a uniform porosity value. We didn't put a whole lot of work into the alluvium sediments other than we wanted to have a uniform top surface and I'll talk more about why it was set up the way it was. Um, but we have a very detailed porosity based off an upscaling of the um, discrete fracture network model and, and lab experiments. Um, but the, this method, there the, 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 the the THM model in, in, at the end of phase two is based off all the relevant site data. Um, actually, it's, it's very complex. And as you'll see, as I go through, we'll start talking about the boundary conditions, you'll see why. Um, we did base those boundary conditions off of the regional pressure, temperature, and topography. Um, the mesh you're seeing here has a, has a structured uh, uniform 50 meter size. Uh, and we use all the results from this for essentially handing back off to the discrete fracture modelers to, uh, to have them the stress environment to embed their DFNs into or their model evolutions into. 
uh, stress boundary conditions came from the DFIT data from the earlier part or the, some of the, the phase two data from the earlier part of phase two. I didn't want to go through this whole talk without spending one slide to talk about the discrete fracture network creation and how we upscaled it. So um, this could be, this likely will be a, a topic for an entire forum um, because so much work went into it. Um, the, what, essentially we start with the FMI data to build a discrete fracture network. Um, there was some bias in there for doing a sampling of in you know, a vertical well, that's our 5832. Um, but we did go through and do a good bit of work to generate stochastic fracture sets and then back compare those, remove the bias, and also condition the DFN to numerous outcrops in the mineral mountains that I showed some of those photographs earlier that had fractured outcrops. So we had a number of geologists measuring those, getting strikes and dips and, and fracture traces and links. So uh, that was, was used constrain and build our, our DFN. So if you take essentially what we had here that we measured in 5832 and FMI logs and the stochastic distributions that we would so intersecting, you know, uh, uh, a synthetic 5832, we get a pretty good result that, that our model, our DFN is representative of the site. And it, this is just shown graphically here. Um, if we take some of the size, rate, the size distributions of the fractures, the full DFN for that phase two model domain, there's uh, I think upwards of six or seven million fractures in there, I could be wrong, uh, but it's a big number. Um, and so that's where we did some upscaling, so which what you see here on the right for the continuum models, this is essentially upscaled permeability based on the fracture intensity within any given grid block. And which you also may notice here at the contact between the alluvial sediments were above and the top of the granite. This is a, there's a weathering or erosional surface at the top of the granite that was more highly fractured. So we have a higher permeability and a higher fracture intensity there. I, want, I didn't want to just leave um, with talking about the phase two model. I want to give a, a teaser here or a preview. Um, so we are actually updating all of the native state models right now where we, you know, there's a lot more data that were collected in phase 2c and there's a time lag between when new data are available when the earth model gets updated and published and then from there the numerical models get updated and republished so we're essentially that wash rinse repeat type cycle uh, of this and so what you're seeing here is essentially is uh, the phase 2 model domain in gray um, and, we're, and what you're seeing all around it these three other volumes that are plotted there are new model domains that we're using to establish or to, to look at sensitivity for the SH max direction. So we have the same domain here at North 25 East, but we also bracket it by range of uncertainty or the, the value we get from the Rose diagram from our breakout analysis. So plus or minus 15 degrees, we're looking at that for the SH max direction. Um, also shown here in the, in the red, this in the red is the 225 degree C isotherm and the opal mound structure as it comes through it. So we're still, all our new model domains are still to the west of the opal mound structure in the conductive zone of the reservoir. Now going back to that smaller domain and, and pulling things here. So as I mentioned earlier, the top boundary conditions are somewhat, uh, or all the boundary conditions are somewhat challenging because of the, uh, the nature of the site. Um, the direction of the, the stress directions essentially don't correspond to the hydraulic gradients, which don't correspond to temperature gradients and temperature flow directions. So we have to be pretty, pretty, pretty creative in, in, in establishing the boundary conditions of the site. I'm not gonna go through every side or every face uh, of the model domain, but suffice to say, we um, the top the top of the model domain factors in, in the pressure based off the groundwater uh, direction and density of the fluids. Um, in, in, in all reality, so we did create model domains that are both in a global coordinate system and all the models and all the work we do are in UTM um, zone 12 north NAT 83 with the national vertical datum, I believe it's 88. I, I could be wrong, I'm not a GIS guy, but um, all the work that we put into the earth model in, in leapfrog and that we push out are in a consistent set of geospatial um, coordinates and referencing to avoid any potential problem with translation. But in order to do uh, the numerical modeling, we also had to define a local set of coordinates. So based on the, on essentially the upper, 
or the bottom the lefternmost western southwesternmost corner of the model domain uh, we set to zero zero and define a local coordinate system which is what you'll see a lot of these things are plotted on where we could essentially rotate and the model domain so that the the directions the principal stress directions are aligned with the mesh directions so it's easier to to, to handle that translation um, what you're seeing here is is the pressure at the top boundary it's actually the hydraulic gradient moving off higher pressure to the 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 right edge or the northwestern side of or northeastern side of the model domain, um, the temperature at the top. So this is actually where I was trying to point out the overflow or the pouring of that hot fluid around the opal mound structure. So what you're seeing here is some fairly hot temperatures. You know, our our top of our model domain is hundreds of meters below ground surface. Um, but what you're seeing here is still a pretty strong influence of that overflow or that leaking of the geothermal fluids around the north end of the opal mount structure. And, and I wanted to point out that we essentially we, so this image on the lower left uh, does go all the way to ground surface. So you could see that the model domain is hundreds of meters below ground surface. And we chose to have that somewhat below there because there's a high amount of vertical, or it's high amount, of, high amount of relief for one thing. There's also a high amount of, of what we interpret to be lateral flow of very hot water that we don't want to try to have to, to, to model that near surface flow in the upper 100 meters or so of the alluvium. So we did everything we uh, all to, to, in order to accommodate that. For the upper stress, we actually did some detailed mapping of, uh, we have detailed LIDAR data, as I said earlier, as well as um, other elevation models, digital elevation models. We were able to actually pull those things into the, to the domain. And the top of the model domain uh, is all in the alluvial sediments. And so as we sit and, and work through to get the, essentially the mass or the mass loading at the top, um, we use some uniform densities um, where possible for the alluvial sediments. That's why the entire top of the model domain is essentially it's in the same geologic material. Now, as I said, I'm not gonna go over every um, boundary condition here. Um, I just wanna show the temperature at the bottom here. So the bottom image here, uh, I actually show 5832 here for reference, but the temperature at the bottom uh, of the model domain is, is approximately 270 degrees C for a maximum. But you can see we have a pretty strong um, gradients in these things and the, the heat source um, for the for the whole area it's not something I really don't want to get into but uh, um, there's there's been lots of work that have been done to try to quantify or estimate what the, the conceptual model for the deep structured heat structures are um, that's a geodynamics problem and, and not an engineering problem so we, we've stayed away from that where our model domain doesn't go to that level of depth where we have partial melts or things that like that to worry about so um, also just shown here, um, pretty simple, where we just applied uh, gradients for SH min, SH max on, and on, on, on the, uh, essentially the back and the left side of the model domain and use traction boundary conditions and fix the other sides to essentially squeeze it in and get the original stresses represented. Also shown, I didn't show this on the website, but I, I kind of alluded to it. Um, in addition to some of the boundary conditions and, and the mesh structures, also on the Utah Forge website, there is a table of the values that we use. If there's a range, um, that's essentially what would, what would come up in, in our some of our or the data we used for the stochastic distributions for parameters. There's also links to the data where you can go right to the GER to pull down the files to, to get that to get the data um, if you want to reproduce the models. Um, in some places, we used a uniform value for things like rock grain density and specific heat, and that's something we'll be working on in the future to do, uh, along with other mechanical properties, some stochastic distributions of those as well. Some of the observations from the native state model is that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this very high, you know, high uh, gradients of, of the temperature, high deltas in the temperature. So that results, we have almost over you know, 200 degree or 200 kilograms per cubic meter difference in fluid density um, from the coldest to the hottest regions of the reservoir. The, um, the per, there's a perturbation and it's shown here in this bottom right hand uh, figure. Um, once again, there's a few of the wells that were used for planning. Ignore those for now. But um, looking at the plots of SH min or isosurfaces of SH min across uh, coming in through, 
green here is the contact between the granite, the granitoid and the alluvium. And we do see a perturbation in SH min that follows that contact. There's also a surface topography effect, um, as I showed here. This is actually at near the bottom or at the 5832 open level. Um, it gets muted from what I showed earlier from the top bottom condition, like nail factoring in uh, the effect of that negro mag wash. Um, Another observation here, I didn't mention earlier that some of the, or I may have, but um, some of the extrapolations for temperature were taken to initially 200 degrees C by the characterization team. But in order to get the model to, to calibrate um, our deeper depths in, in the earth model, we had to raise that to maximum temperature to 290 uh, in order to get, uh, we still matched the gradients, but to get the gradients to match, we had to do that. And all of these things led to a pretty good calibration to the log data at, uh, in 5832. Um, many of you may have seen these plots before, but what you're seeing here is um, temperature and the vertical stress um, and plotted together. The blue line is measured um, for the pressure and temperature that is measured from uh, well logging conducted November of 2018. The red dots are essentially a, down, a, a partially sampled um, from the reservoir model. Uh, we're pretty happy with the pressure and temperature temperature matches. The the stress match here, we see the maximum uh, stresses, uh, vertical stresses, just a hair under 60 MPA at the bottom of the model domain. Actually, I'm sorry, at the bottom of well 5832. The model domain does extend beyond um, the bottom of this plot by a considerable degree. Um, uh, where our SH min and SH max is, uh, essentially these lines are extrapolated by the gradients, uh, but the measurements all happened essentially at the very bottom in the open hole section of, of 5832 and, and just applying what those gradients were as, as a far field boundary condition came pretty close to matching it. And at that point, um, it's within the variability of what was measured at the site. So we uh, considered the model fairly well calibrated to the data that we had and uh, we're happy to, to move on and make some conclusions from the native state models. And one of those is that we had to use very complex boundary conditions. And you saw some of those uh, distributions there. It's not just a linear gradient um, in order to get good pressure and temperature calibration. Uh, that perturbation SH min from the leaf of the granitoid basin, uh, we were a little bit worried about that. It could have impacts in well completion, or so you, you see that perturbation in SH min could make it harder to get a good, uh, uh, essentially, or to come in with a completed well and doing the well builds. So we're trying to keep a close eye on that. Uh, we do think that the native state model gives us a solid foundation for assessing potential well trajectories, um, and, but I will caveat all this that additional simulations and realizations will be required to address all the to address the uncertainty and the stress direction and magnitude and um, that's kind of a, a teaser for something that's going to happen next um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time I'm transitioning here I, I didn't want to just talk only about the native state model but something that we used it for so um, we did evaluate three years um, phase three well trajectories right now we, we've looked at four potential trajectories essentially going out different directions along or somewhat off of SH min and either coming from the east moving to the west or from the west to move to the east. Um, you can't see them all here, but on this plot shown is a number of wells and we, and we named them as as we went just well 3-1A, B, C and, and kept moving on from there um, with A, B and C being the location of where we started from. And then if we had multiple ones, we would change that name a little bit. But so what you're seeing are some of the well orientations that we um, evaluated. Um, and by and large, uh, in general, the, the initial three would would build at 5.5 degrees per 100 feet. So, so how we come up that radius. Um, kick off at about 1800 meters depth and have a 1300 meter lateral. That's these three, or there's actually three of these gold colored wells. One starts here and goes this way to the west. One actually started to the to the west and went to the east on the exact same track. Um, now those wells actually, we had them terminated at, uh, I believe it was 75 degrees C for the tangent section. Uh, we actually have engaged a detailed uh, analysis of, of well orientations paths and uh, uh, put together a drilling and analysis team uh, made up of some, some pretty strong industry experts. And uh, another trajectory that we analyzed, what we called 3-1A2 as the modeling team, it's in red and it goes this direction. Um, this well builds at five degrees per hundred, um, it's final tangent section is 65 degrees uh, and don't hold me to the kickoff so it's approximately 2,000 meters a little bit less than that now um, but this red well is essentially what has been chosen to be the first forge 
um, full-sized well. Um, it now has an official name and that well is called 16A7832. And that's the Kettleman coordinates for that well trajectory. And that well is actually being actively planned um, as we speak. I'm not gonna go into all the modeling that went essentially doing stimulation models. So we essentially took all those wells, all those trajectories and did some stimulation models for the toe section of each one to look at the potential impact of the differences in the stress direction uh, or the stress magnitudes in different locations within the model domain to see if that added um, or if that had much of an impact. But in the end, there were differences in the stimulation results for all these, but the, uh, the simulations did suggest that stimulation was successfully, could, could successfully be carried out any of the trajectories by a combination of shear and tensile failure. Um, the details of all these models, I'm gonna save for a future forum. Um, this is just one of the teasers for that. And so we, 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 I mentioned earlier, we need to look at differences in stress directions and magnitudes and, and sensitivity of that. And so this on the left here um, does give some indication that the models can be highly sensitive. Different colors here, different, different magnitudes for estimates of SH min. So with, with essentially a, a recommended value of SH min, we get one set of ranges for um, extent of fractures in a relative sense. Um, if we use the minimum SH min, we get quite a bit larger normalized distance for uh, a simulated fracture using the same stimulation treatment. And we also did some pretty detailed looks at uh, predicted MEQs um, for a number of those different trajectories. Uh, by and large, we came up with about magnitude one and a half was the biggest we could do, injecting at 50 kilograms per second for two hours. So a summary, I realize I'm about 15 minutes longer than I wanted to talk, but I, that's what happens when you put Gordy speaks. Um, this will be the initial baseline characterizations and activities. They did culminate in a reference earth model. And that essentially that earth model is what you used to, to essentially parameterize an, an initial uh, reservoir model. The native state THM model has been created and calibrated. Um, we looked for a number of potential, uh, essentially stimulation potential has been baselined. Um, and um, all the simulations that suggest that we can do a successful stimulations at any of the trajectories that we want to do. I'm not going to talk in this a whole lot of detail, just there's continuing um, modeling activities that are going to be happening. As we move into phase three, we have a detailed plan. So we're doing some detailed um, stress sensitivity analyses in the native state model, also material sensitivity, um, looking at wellbore stability and completion analysis, looking at a lot of hydraulic stimulation and developing a stimulation plan and uh, uh, continue refining the DFN as we get more data, uh, essentially be rebuilding that DFN with, with our goal in, in the end is to be as close to having a deterministic DFN and less stochastic as long as we're near well, well control and, and long-term thermohydro mechanic and chemical uh, simulations as well. So I'm gonna stop here. Um, I know I've been talking for a long time. I will try to just pan through the questions um, and see if I can answer some of these. And I may have to link back into some of my modeling team colleagues. Um, I see people have been answering some of these things as we go. So it might be a little bit hard for me to, to do some of this, but I will do my best to answer some of these questions as I scroll through them. Okay, moving through here. Okay, this question here. Beyond the Opal Mound Fault, did the excess pressure form fractures which resulted in flows in the forge site? Um, I believe the answer to that would be no. So, but I, I'm, if I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question incorrectly, but, or correctly. So we did a, lot, a good bit of work. The geology team led by Stuart Stimmons did a good bit of work on looking at a whole bunch of indicators that could, that would look for any natural flow west of the Obermont Fault with um, noble, I believe it's noble gases and other, other, uh, other methods. Um, there's, we found no evidence of essentially any hydrothermal or, or native or natural um, uh, mantle-based fluid or, or natural convection to the west side of the fault. Um, there's a very detailed story that goes into the, the what's creating the fractures in, in the geologic regime. I'm not going to go into that one, but I can if if you want to follow up with your question, I think we can get uh, um, more clarification on uh, some of that geologic or the, the his, geologic history of the site over geologic time, which may have contributed to why that Opal Mount structure is the way it is and the way the, way the site it is. Um, 
I'm moving down here. Uh, did you try combined finite discrete method du during numerical simulation? Yes and no. So we actually do, did some models where we built in uh, discreetly mapped the, the DFN into a continuum model using unstructured meshes. The, uh, we didn't have a whole, well, I'd say we had success provided the number of fractures that were discreetly meshed um, weren't, wasn't too large of a number. The, uh, the larger that number gets, the harder the meshing becomes. Numerically, it's not bad, but it, it's hard having the mesh quality. I know there's ways that people have to get, do essentially a continuum mesh and, and then do translations um, of parameters between the two excuse me, uh, do transfers between the two numerical domains. Um, that is not, some, that's not a method that we have used, but it is something that, that's, that will be looked at. What we've primarily done is, is you know, for all the, the shorter term detailed stimulation models that we use are the discrete methods. Um, once those simulations give us a, a stimulated fracture volume, we can have a direct workflow to take that volume, either upscale it, um, and move it into a continuum code or continue running it in one of the uh, other other modeling frameworks. Or we can actually, yeah, um, or discrete, if it's not a whole lot, big number of fractures, we can directly mesh them in and create a separate thing. Um, we have a really streamlined workflow that takes um, stochastic distributions of any parameter and essentially can build structured meshes really easily. The unstructured meshes are a lot more of a challenge to create. And if I'm not answering your questions, um, there is an email address, that, um, and I think we could send it out here to, on the chat or respond to everybody um, on, on the call with what that address is, so you can email questions back in. And I know others have already sent emailed some questions in, and I intentionally have not um, uh, I've done that yet, because I wanted to get through this first. I see Joanne um, did answer about the, the FDEM. So yeah, so that's some of the work actually, I, I didn't mention that, that uh, uh, it's really hasn't, it's been done for more small scaled things, but not for full production runs, or do some of those cohesive zone or those other kind of works. Um, question, was there any serious observed damages to the reservoir? during drilling operations that were reflected in the stimulation operations, like high wellhead pressures. What we've seen, uh, like what we've seen in Pohang um, in South Korea. Um, I'm not the best person to answer that question, but I, I can give the answer as best I can. And that is the um, no, I guess is, is the basic, is the answer to that question. So um, this well was drilled, uh, the 5832, was drilled with very light, uh, light mud. Um, we didn't have any circulation losses, or, or I think we've had any mud losses at all during the drilling that well. Once we got into the the the, the competent granitic part of the reservoir, um, so that was actually one again. This gave us confidence of the the tightness uh, of the the reservoir itself. Um, we did do FMI logs um, pre like multiple runs of FMI logs pre-stimulation test or pre-defit, pre-micro um, frac or mini frac tests. And we did actually get some, um, we were able to you know, detect changes in the well where we did create some fractures and we did actually detect some um, drilling induced fractures, but I would say heavily, heavy damage, uh, it would, the answer would be no. And somebody may have already answered that. Um, I'm just gonna keep talking though. So this is great. Thanks for helping answer these questions. Um, were the graphics that are being shown done on leapfrog geothermal? Um, yes, most of the graphics were. Um, some of the graphics that I'm also showing are by my own um, or mine or the team's um, Python processing routines that we've written just to especially data wrangling in, in Python, which is, our, which is my preferred tool for, for doing the, that kind of work. I'm still scrolling through questions here and I realize some of these already may have been answered. Um, is there any studying on the fault structure, including hydrogeological properties or, or the fracture characteristics of the damage zone? And my phone is ringing. Hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn here. Um, let me kill this call. Um, uh, I saw on the slides you have used DFN simulator to simulate the fracture distribution. 
So, yes, okay, so um, I can just, I'll answer part of that, and I think somebody already may have popped in and answered. So yes, we, we've used FRACMAN to essentially process all of our fracture information, and that's led by Alita Fanella. I think Alita, maybe, if, Gosha, if you could unmute Alita, she's on and answering. Maybe she could just pop in and answer that question better than Hi, I could. I'm on, and um, yeah, we do, we do have a publication from the Stanford workshop in 2019 on developing the first reference discrete fracture network model which goes into detail describing the the fractures so that would be a good good reference to look at and that's certainly available um it's available through the utah forge website i yeah. believe on the publications page or the outreach page it, it is available right from our website so you can download that without a license and it's uh, you know, with no copyright restrictions so it's available thanks alita Um, still scrolling through questions here. Uh, looks like some of the things got uh, partially answered and partially uh, repeated here from time to time. So I'm just trying to scroll through here. Um, are these slides available on the Forge website or somewhere else? I'd like to better understand the STEM modeling work that has been completed. Um, well, these slides won't talk about the stimulation modeling, but uh, yes, I believe these slides will be made available. We'll, we'll actually work on putting a section on the modeling page uh, at Utah Forge um, that essentially has a log of our, well, maybe put, put a, a sub page that for the forum that will have the slides, that will have the recordings and, and have a running Q&A. Also on there is once we get things going and I'll ask for everyone's input if, um, you know, if monthly sounds good, I'll be looking for, you know, in addition to our modeling team, looking for other people who are trying to work and do some modeling at the site if they want to give presentations. Um, I'll be looking for volunteers and putting together uh, a rolling agenda uh, for the forum as we move forward. Um, so, yes, that will be available. And all the, you know, and the stimulation modeling, um, in addition to other detailed, like, say, long term operational models that we've completed, those will all be topics um, for future um, forums. Uh, I may have gotten to the last question. How is stochastic modeling in contrast with the temperatures actually observed in the well? Um, so the temperature in the well, we, the uh, basically all the, the, the gradients and the temperature measured in the well it shows no influence of any flow in the fractures at native state conditions. So essentially it's purely conduction dominated um, in, in, in the reservoir part um, below the site. So the stochastic modeling, um, it, we actually got really strong um, calibration to the temperature. We did see you know, inflection of the temperature at, at the, the contact between the, or the change in gradient at the, between the alluvial sediments and the granitic reservoir. But um, it, uh, it was still, you know, we didn't see any, any implant of like uh, any conduction at all, or any convection in, in the in the reservoir part of this. Um, it's yeah, so it's if we do get flow, I mean, so our base measurement um, thing from rock samples and core samples, our permeability that they measured in the lab was in the order of ten to the minus eighteen uh, meters squared. So getting to your question here, it, yeah, we we would expect. Um, any and all flow will be fracture dominated uh, at the site. And even when we do some of the, the initial pressure leak off tests, the, the, the reservoir held pressure, you know, for a considerable amount of time. So there's very, very, very little leak off. Uh, I wouldn't want to get too deep into the weeds on that one, let the reservoir engineers talk about that. But um, um, that gets me to the end of the questions. If uh, there are no other questions, unless I missed something or I didn't catch your question, you can feel free to, um, uh, okay, another question came in. Any particular reason to conduct the modeling in leapfrog instead of patrol? Um, we used, we've used both. Um, we have a strong partnership with, with leapfrog um, from the workflow point of view. So, you know, each of those packages have their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, we, we've been pretty happy with the work we've done in leapfrog. So um, it's a different workflow, I think, and, and jumping into it to where, where you're coming from. So that's the real reason is we have a strong partnership with, with Sequent. Um, I'd say we don't have one with Schlumberger. We do that as well, but um, that's in our choice. 
um, last chance for any questions. If not, we're going to close it and uh, we'll follow up with everyone here for a, a continuing schedule for these. And I really thank you for attending today. Thank you for your attention. Um, I know it's a lot to listen to, to me talk for, for an hour or more, but uh, I really appreciate you coming along today. I'm really excited to work with the community and, and get this going. So thanks all. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Rob.